Justin Valentine. Oh, recording in progress, apparently. My name is Justin Valentine. I'm a barrister at St John's Chambers, specialising predominantly in uh, clinical negligence and also personal injury. Um, I'm told that at the end there will be some uh, an online form for feedback. Um, and that's probably all I need to say. There is space for questions at the end, um, although it's always difficult to be obviously put on the spot in the moment. Um, so feel free to drop me a line afterwards. It's sometimes better that way. OK, so moving swiftly on. OK, so teamwork I have put here, which is you know, in, in some senses, it's sort of obvious that effective teamwork is pivotal uh, in successful litigation. But I do always find that the cases where we feel that we've got the best result, we've been the most in control during the litigation, um, and we've got more out of it perhaps than we thought we were going to, is where there's been a really effective team. Uh, and that means that you'll constantly have an eye of consistency of purpose and clarity of mind. There are no sort of rogue factors involved. And I do include in that uh, the experts too. Obviously, if the experts are saying something inconsistent with the overall uh, case narrative, then that needs to be addressed. Obviously, sometimes there's little you can do about it and you have to bear in mind clearly the experts' independence. But um, if everybody is uh, singing from the same song sheet in broad terms, then you're more likely to get an effective result. And that's also about very effective communication. Cons and frequent discussion are pivotal to ensure that everything that is sent or served is consistent with the overall case narrative. Uh, and pitfalls and weaknesses should be anticipated so far as they can, and litigation should be pursued robustly and with precision. So I've got a slide here about making life easier for yourself. And a lot of this has come out of COVID uh, because we've all gone electronic to a lesser or greater extent. Um, medical records in all clinical negligence cases, substantial PR cases should be PDF, OCR and indexed. And if nobody knows what OCR is, it's optical character recognition. It's merely so that you can actually highlight a particular word, you can search for it and so forth. If that is done in the outs at the outset, it saves other people doing it. When I get bundles of medical records that have not been OCR'd, the first thing I do is OCR them, um, which for a bundle of a thousand pages, for example, can take about four hours. So I sort of set it off and walk, walk away or do it overnight or something. Um, but if it's done at the outset, preferably, preferably by professional paginators, then the job's done for you. If medical records come in subsequently, well, then they can be OCR'd and put in a separate bundle or, or joined at the end of the bundle. Um, professional paginators in ClinNeg will also provide a chronology. I should flag up there that the chronology is only partial and they miss vital entries sometimes. I had a con earlier this week where it was um, a quarter equina case where uh, surgery was on a, not undertaken, we say, because he just developed a systemic infection from his cannula sites. Um, and it was an issue of whether we could show what the plan was before we had the infection. Our expert had basically used the chronology to look at the various articulations of the plan, the surgical plan, but he'd actually missed a really vital en entry, which was handwritten. And, the, and, and he'd missed it because the people doing the chronology had also missed it. So it's really important to check the medical records themselves. And obviously you, you'll be knowing where to look because it'll be around the other entries. Um, and it's important to get that chronology set out. And again, it saves a lot of time in the future. Multiple documents can be combined with PDF software. I still do get um, 20 or 30 documents, some of which are Word, some of which are uh, PDFs. What I tend to do if I get that is I turn the Word documents into PDFs and then I combine them all with um, PDF software. I don't use Adobe. In fact, I use a thing called Foxy Phantom, which is about a tenth of the price and does exactly the same thing. Um, another issue which I sometimes get is PDFs with restrictions. Experts often use it. It means you can't highlight them. It would be a bit like having a hard copy file 
um, which had been um, put in plastic, so to speak. You can't actually highlight it. It makes it incredibly uh, unhelpful to use. And in those cases, I actually print it to a PDF, which I can then highlight, including OCRing it afterwards. That's the, you know, the extent to which I sort of go to make sure I've got one big PDF bundle, which is OCR'd. Uh, and it's incredibly useful in during litigation because you can search for terms and bookmarks used. Uh, I, I mean, this has arisen in a number of cases. I've got one at the moment where um, someone with high blood pressure uh, sustained a stroke. So I can actually do a search for blood pressure within his GP records, seeing what occasions it had been checked or not and whether warnings had been given. Um, or for smoking, for example, you know, I had a case where they said, well, he's had, you know, been smoking for so many years, so much. But again, you can do a, a search for that term, um, but you can't do that if it's not OCR. So OCR PDF medical records are a huge advance in terms of running litigation, certainly in any case where there's a lot of medical records to look at. And it's not just ClinNeg, it can be uh, pain cases, for example, can be incredibly helpful where there's thousands of pages. And obviously cons can be recorded in Teams and Zoom, which makes life a lot easier if you then want to revisit what's been said. Obtaining a good proof of evidence, I'm a big fan of this because what the client says has gone wrong and why. Obviously, sometimes they are barking up the wrong tree, but often they get it exactly right. And they have important things to say. In the case I just mentioned where the surgery was not undertaken because of the infection, the client said, I specifically remember that they couldn't, that they said to me that they couldn't do the operation because of this infection and they'd revisited in a couple of weeks. That was sort of implicit, but when the client remembers it, categorically clearly in that way and you add it to what's also in the medical records it turns something which is you know sort of 60 percent prospects of success into something which is more like 70 percent prospects of success in pro proving that particular allegation and a bit like the bicycle uh, the cycling team in the olympics it's all about marginal gains anything that you can do to marginally gain a percentage here or there then it's going to improve your prospects of success and it will make settlement easier and approaching settlement on a risk basis as you should, then you will get a better outcome. Client insights I've put there often prove fruit fruitful, particularly in workplace claims and clinical negligence. And obviously check consistency with your OCR medical records and with other documentation once obtained. I've sort of put the obvious there, the court always attaches most weight to contemporaneous records. Always have a con to discuss the statement before it's served, and judges will generally allow the cost of this at a CCMC. Instructing the first expert, um, it's always a question of which expert to go first, and obviously has to be an eye on cost. Um, often in ClinNeg, it's causation, not breach of duty. You may know quite clearly what has gone wrong, and it may be that you think, well, the causative aspects of this are the more important ones. And if you're looking with an eye of cost of saying, well, can we pursue this case, then you go to a causation expert first. Um, and obviously in relation to breach, you instruct an expert of uh, like discipline and you can hold off on CNP, condition and prognosis, quantum reports essentially for non clinic practitioners. Uh, in PI, look to the most significant injury, you only need one report issue. And daisy chaining of experts. This shouldn't be an issue, but it is. You often get a claim where I had one a couple of weeks ago at CCMC where we, we were looking for an accommodation report and the defendant's counsel said, well, there isn't a sort of unambiguous, unequivocal statement that they need an accommodation report. And I said, well, look, you don't need that from an expert to say that you need an accommodation report. And let's look at this passage, that passage, you know, difficulty with stairs, mo mainly spending his time upstairs and all the rest of it. Um, he, clearly an accommodation report was indicated and the judge did give it, give it to us. In PI, I find this is more of a problem than ClinNeg. And the way around that, obviously, is what I've called daisy chaining them, which is just simply to say to the experts, can you say that we need also a psychological report, a vascular expert, an accommodation report, a care expert, whatever it is? And 95% of the time, or always, but they're, they're going to be very happy to oblige, which in some senses proves that you shouldn't really need it. But um, defendants often take this point so um, I think it's sensible to uh, ask experts to deal with it. 
And I made the observation there that in clinical negligent letters of claim can sometimes be sent without expert evidence, e.g. based on admissions in the serious incident investigation report or the root cause analysis report, as they used to be called, or if simply the case is very strong. And in those situations, I make it crystal clear, you know, we have not got expert evidence from an obstetrician yet um, as to this stillbirth claim. But based on the serious incident investigation report, these are the failings, X, Y, Z. You will save the cost of us obtaining that report if you make uh, admissions based on what we have read. Obviously, if you do, do not make those admissions, we'll go off and get that expert evidence. So we're absolutely crystal clear that we've based it on the evidence that we've got. Um, and we've given the defendants the option of um, either admitting liability, admitting breach of duty on the basis of what are, is in those documents or, or essentially putting them to their election, or we will go off and get that evidence. Uh, letters of claim can neg, inform the defendant of what expert evidence has been obtained and confirm that it's supportive as to breach causation, whatever, and obtain from an expert, identify the profession, but don't name them. Ensure that factual and medical causation mesh precisely with allegations of breach. You do sometimes get allegations of breach which haven't got any medical causation. There's no point really in putting those in. The defendants will just simply say, well, there's no causation that arises out of that quite correctly. And note that if breach and causation are admitted, further evidence will be confined to CMP. Again, that's essentially an offer. Well, look, here's a way we can save costs on this and move forward more swiftly. Um, I always think that it's sensible to mention specifically paragraph 3.24 of the protocol, um, pre-action protocol, which in broad terms requires a claimant to be able to identify exactly what is admitted and what not, and obviously keep an eye on limitation and ask if necessary for an extension. Letters of response in clinical negligence. This also applies, in fact, to uh, personal injury. Um, maybe, maybe some of it does, may betray an absence of supportive medical evidence. As I've said, look out for responses not in keeping with para 3.24 of the pre-action protocol. Sometimes the reasoning is modelled, obviously so, and that can be just in the, as the same as personal injury. There's been a misunderstanding of what it is precisely that's being said. If it appears that uh, the defendant wants settlement, spell out the assumptions you're making so there's clarity over what it is that's being admitted, whether you therefore can dispense with certain evidence that you otherwise would have wanted to get. Uh, if appropriate, respond to the letter of response, but be cautious of getting, into, getting drawn into litigation by correspondence. As a general point, always be or try to be in control. I dare say if you for a defendant, you always try to be in control from, from that perspective as well. But in, in my view, a claimant should drive the litigation, not the defendant. The claimant is the one who has been injured, allegedly negligently. Uh, being in control means taking the initiative to set the agenda in a broad sense, being proactive and not reactive. And every step taken should be designed to advance the litigation. If you do nothing, then you do it with purpose. So, for example, you know, I do get claims where we are obtaining quantum evidence. It's due in two months or four months or something. We're not yet ready to put even a draft schedule together. You then get a part 36, you know, £400,000 or something where, you know, it's incredibly difficult to know. And then the defendant will chase you and say, well, look, what do you think about this? What I generally say is, you know, leave it on the table or write to them, say, you know, we're having to think about it. Um, so if you do nothing, do it with a particular purpose. What you don't want to do with part 36 offers is say it's not quite enough or we, re you know, we reject it for X, Y, Z reason. But, but that invites drip feeding offers, which is the worst thing that you want, really, when you are not in a position properly to value the case. Because at some point within that drip feed of high, slightly higher offers, you might get an offer which puts the claimant at risk and you're not properly in a position to value the claim at that stage. So moving cases on should always the underpin the task of problem solving. It's, well, you know, what are we going to do to actually get this thing moving, to move forward? Um, articulating problems often resolves them. Um, discuss the issues with colleagues and counsel. And I put counsel there not just as a sort of self-serving observation, but sometimes I know that solicitors don't feel entirely comfortable with speaking to their colleagues. They may feel that they're, you know, they should know the answer. I, I don't generally feel that about um, issues. You know, litigation is difficult. 
you know, a lot of the issues are conceptual. There are difficult concepts involved. Tactical issues require, you know, a lot of balancing of pros and cons, and you need to speak about them. So, but either way, it's better to discuss these points and putting pen to paper can assist, um, i.e. emails to council. I've booked there. Sometimes even, you know, I sort of start drafting it, an email to a solicitor, well, you know, this is the issue, there's this or there's that. Um, and I actually find that putting pen to paper actually resolves it. It's all about asking the right question, so to speak. And once you've asked the right question, the uh, answer becomes more apparent. Pressure to meet deadlines causes stress and errors, so always act timious, timiously. I sometimes think it's, it's the same as when you're, you know, having your tea, to use the sort of northern word. Do you start with the um, food that you don't like first, you know, your sprouts and... Um, your broccoli and ending up with your nice piece of um, fish, or do you start with that first, so to speak? I, I always try to do things strictly in order, personally speaking, but it's better to deal with um, the thorniest cases first, move those on, because then it takes the stress out of your own life. Cases aren't like um, fine wines or aged cheeses that don't improve with keeping. And clients obviously like litigation to be performed swiftly, so it keeps them happy. Uh, as a general point, try not to get involved in pr protracted disputes on satellite issues. Always see the bigger picture. Don't respond to the letter of response in clinical negligence and less advances litigation. Uh, protracted correspondence does not appear strategically strong. Try not to get bogged down in conversations with uh, pushy opponents on the phone. I must say that happens much less, I think, in clinical negligence uh, than it does in personal injury. There are some, you know, there are some quite pushy people out there in, in terms of PI. Um, and, you know, they can be a little bit um, bullying sometimes, but if you need time, um, take it. So experts, uh, if the expert is unsupportive in clinical negligence, get them into calm, much better than asking questions for a variety of reasons. Um, if you just ask questions, this is on the next slide as well, in fact, if you just ask questions, all, all you're going to get is a restatement of what it is that they've just said and a, a continuing misunderstanding of your perhaps more sensible point that you're asking them to address or your more sensible take on the evidence. Um, so get, get them into con. I, you know, I'm not a fan of asking questions of your own experts unless it's very straightforward. Uh, and curiously, the Part 35 procedure is quite misunderstood in that respect. Questions are only by the other side of experts, not by you of your own experts, or a lot of people sort of ignore that, including myself. I'm guessing on certain occasions, or consider obtaining another report if proportionate. I, I mean, that's somewhat controversial, I suppose you could say, because it's obviously the Bolan test is about a reasonable body of medical opinion skilled in that particular art. So if you've got an expert who says, well, there's no breach of duty because it wasn't Bolan unreasonable, then there shouldn't be any grounds for obtaining another report. But it's simply the reality of litigation that sometimes there is. I recall a failure to diagnose breast cancer case where the issue had been raised by the defendant was that the previous film scans couldn't effectively be compared with the subsequent digitized scans because of the loss of definition when they digitized the film scans. And it just seemed to me that that was almost a sort of functional systematic systemic failure, not something that should really be about the bone test. We went off and got another report and it was entirely in our favor. And the, and the claim subsequently settled to the JSM. So do consider obtaining another report if it's proportionate, if you feel there is something in the case and trust your instincts, obviously, or obviously just drop the case and don't persist with cases which aren't going anywhere. Subject the opinion to critical analysis and ensure experts cite relevant literature. In this day and age, experts shouldn't be really in the arena of trust me, I'm an expert, but you still do get reports which basically say, well, this is just a matter of clinical opinion and this is, you know, my opinion, so to speak. There must be, there's relevant literature on nearly everything these days and experts should cite it if they're doing their job properly. So experts carried on, um, have a con with an expert or ring them up. Don't write questions requesting clarification unless the issue is very straight, straightforward. Experts often modify and sharpen their view in con. There's lots of cases where I've had experts express something in a report. The, it's been sent to me and the solicitor has said, look, this is a bit of a negative report. What do you think we should do? And I say, let's get them in con. And sometimes what I do is put a little discussion document 
together to which sort of tweaks and, and then send that over to the solicitors or send it to the expert. And amazingly, the experts do an about face in con and say, OK, I see the point now. Um, and now you put it like that. Obviously, they wouldn't quite say it like that, but they say looking, looking at it a bit more closely. Um, and But they do often modify and sharpen their view in con. You know, they're busy people um, like we are. And, you know, sometimes they rush through things a bit too quickly. They don't see the subtlety. They miss something in the chronology for a whole variety of reasons. But it would be naive to think that uh, getting your expert into con and discussing their uh, opinion with them does not modify and sharpen their view. Uh, and what I often suggest is the send a letter after the con with the requested amendments and the transcript if available highlighting the relevant parts. It may be, of course, particularly in clinical negligence, that you don't actually need them to amend their report at that stage. If you've had a con uh, pre-issue and pre-letter of claim and you're preparing the letter of claim, the expert said something in con sufficient for the letter of claim to be drafted, you wouldn't bother, I wouldn't bother asking the expert to amend their report at that stage. I get the letter of claim sent off. We've got it in black and white, what the expert has said in con. There's hopefully a transcript of it um, because it's been recorded in Zoom or in Teams. And uh, that's enough to get the letter of claim sent off. And if, it, when, if and when it needs amendment, which obviously strictly speaking is after service of witness statements, and certainly after the defence, then that's the time that you can then go back and ask for an amendment just to save costs, obviously. Uh, ensure the legal test is correctly stated. Uh, I mean, this is an, an issue because obviously the legal test is so um, awkwardly put, um, you know, a, a, a practitioner is not negligent if they have acted in line with um a reasonable body of medical practitioners so it's sort of expressed in the negative um so sometimes they say a reasonable body would not have would have not have acted in this way well that's not what the test is so you have to obviously get them to put it properly uh and there's a lot of cases now where you can identify belito unreasonableness which is in broad terms that there may be a body of medical practitioners who would do what was done, what was done, or who would not do what was not done, but they'd be wrong to do so. Um, and I've got a recent example of that, which settled at a joint settlement meeting, uh, which was a prosthetic joint infection case. We settled it for one and a half millions in the event. Um, basically, she got an infection to her hip from the prosthesis, and she underwent in total 10 unnecessary washouts um, and they didn't even remove the metalwork until about the sixth washout. Our orthopaedic expert said that this was utterly pointless, washout after washout, you need to remove all foreign material swiftly, um, and cited quite a lot of material to justify that. The defendant came to the JSM saying, look, we can't really, I'm putting words into their mouth in a way, we can't really dispute that it was the wrong thing to do, but we still say that there is a reasonable body of medical practitioners who would have done what these medical practitioners do. It's not a strong hand, uh, bearing in mind Belito and subsequent case law and the risks that you're putting them in. And there's a lot of cases actually where you can get Belito unreasonableness into the argument. Uh, C and P, make sure all your experts' reports are consistent with another before you serve them. Obviously, you have to serve one at least one with the particulars of claim, uh, but if not, get them in con and iron out any inconsistencies. Dispense with the voice that is discordant. Um, you know, I've certainly had quite big claims where we've had all of the experts, the physio, orthotist, orthopedic, you know, singing from one song sheet, and then maybe you've got a neuro neurologist who's, you know, a discordant voice, and frankly, the other experts can't understand what on earth that expert is banging on about. That's no way to proceed with the case. You just simply have to dispense with it if it's um, you know cut the cut the get rid of the bad apple in the in the um, apple cart so to speak. You can't you can't go into litigation with a voice that is discordant. Um, in a similar vein, consider whether you really need a pain expert. They they all bang on now about the biopsychosocial model, and they use words like catastrophizing. I dare say they use it in a sort of um, you know educated pain medicine model way. 
Uh, but, you know, we all know what catastrophizing means. It means making something of nothing or making more of it than they should make. So there are a lot of cases where I feel that uh, pain experts are instru instructed unnecessarily. And judges have said that sort of thing at CCMs to me. You know, well, what's this pain expert going to say that it hurts? You can say, well, yes. So, I mean, there are cases, obviously, where um, a pain expert is warranted. Clearly, in a pain case, they're warranted. And in other cases where it's primarily pain, I had a case where it was a facial injury to the nerves of the face, and apparently it's intensely painful, and there's good literature for that. Obviously, it was required in that case. But in sort of back injury claims, I, I do query whether you really do need a pain expert. Um, and as a general point, finalise so far as you can medical, medical expert reports before you commission care and accommodation, because you only have to revisit them otherwise. Just a point on agendas, and obviously this is for personal injury as well, far too much time is spent wrestling with them, adopt an inclusive approach and then tell the defendants that what's, that's what you're doing, experts can usually sort it out for themselves, ensure the order contains, if not agreed, then both agendas are sent, which is in the standard KVD directions, uh, and address clinical currency if necessary, please set out briefly your respective current practice in relation to whatever it is. And that will expose experts a long time. You can usually work it out from their date of um, uh, qualification. I mean, I had an oncology case recently. We put that in, we, and he said, it, he said, I've retired. It's not applicable. We knew he was in his 80s, and he probably didn't want to go to court, poor old chap. And it did, in fact, settle. Um, I, without prejudice disclosure of expert evidence, I'm not really in fan of it, a fan of it at all. Should only be done on a reci reciprocal basis dangerous that the defender is able to perfect their evidence yeah maybe but i you know the real issue about this is 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 a waste of time um because i've had cases where all of that's been done and then you ultimately end up issuing and you've just lost a year or two of the litigation uh preparing particulars of claim um, in clinical negligence, discuss draft particulars of claim with experts and client in confidence to perfect the document, and the same with the letter of claim. That's, a, that's one of my sort of key um, operational sort of modes of conduct, so to speak, is um, get that draft POC and then get your experts and client in con to perfect it, to make sure everybody's happy with it. Experts often help to get it right, to get the wording right in terms of breach and in terms of causation. Uh, and similarly in PI, discuss the draft POC with the client and with any liability experts. We all know that, um, you know, lawyers being institutionalised, we all think that everybody's highly accurate in terms of um, their factual recollection at all times. It isn't true, uh, but we're trained to look at that sort of thing. Um, and it's important to iron out those difficulties and again to get a narrative which is accurate and consistent at the outset. You don't want to introduce ambiguities into the particulars of claim. Uh, it moves the case forward and it clarifies issues. The client can contribute, understand the process and assist preparation of witness evidence. Often there are issues I, you know, client will say X, Y, Z. I say, well, that's not a matter really for the particulars of claim, but it's fantastic uh, material to put in the witness evidence. And can we make a note of that? Highlights his weaknesses and early says, ensures experts are fully supportive of allegations and can be undertaken effectively with Teams Zoom. Minimise the defendants. Uh, Analyse whether you really need more than one defendant. Lays the groundwork, lay the groundwork for a claim that the losing defendant will be liable for winning the defend for winning defendants' costs if you must claim a more than more, more than one. Essentially, that means writing to the defendant you think is in the frame and saying, look, if you consist on blaming this other defendant, we're going to have to join them. Uh, and we expect you to be liable for the cost because we really don't think that they are in the frame. All of that helps in, you know, what they used to be called a Sanderson or a Bullock sort of order. Uh, and that's the issue of the, the issue of concept of uh, joint several joint and several liability is important. important. Even if the two defendants are liable, you may only need one, particularly in workplace. And it makes settlement much harder as the defendants bicker as to who is liable. The key question is whether there is a world where D1 could not be found liable and D2 would. If you must succeed against D1, were you to see, succeed against D2, then you don't need D2. D2. And I've got two examples of that. I had a recent claim where Particulars of claim weren't drafted by me. Um, 
but the, the chap was crushed by a telehandler um, and his employer was in the frame, as was the hirer of the telehandler, the people who owned the telehandler, who um, hired it to the employer. The question there is, is there a world in which, bearing in mind the non delegable duty of an employer, the hirer of the equipment would have been liable and the employer not? I would have answered that question, no, and I wouldn't have joined the hirer of the equipment. The case in the event settled long after it should have done, uh, basically a week before trial. And I'm quite certain that the main reason for this was the two defendants bickering. And I understand, in fact, that they split liability between themselves on an 80-20 basis, I 80% for the employer and 20% for the hire of the equipment. It wasn't the split I would have made, actually, but anyway. Um, and again, you can have it in clinical negligence. You've got a physiotherapy and a GP in a diabetic foot case or in a cord or a quina case. There's been some failure to spot the deterioration of a vascular problem in the diabetic foot by both the GP and the physio. Well, the GP generally is further up on the pecking order. Now, the physio may very well be liable in both of those examples, but is there a world in which the physio could be liable and the GP not? Uh, and I don't think there is. So there is no need, even if you have a good case against the physio, because of joint and several liability, to join them. Uh, and with the way costs are going, these are quite important principles to remember. Replies and part 18s, important counter allegations and ambiguity should be responded to. Part 18s, I think, should always be made formally, so they go into the trial bundle. A robust defence requires a robust reply. The aim is to move the case forward to exert tactical pressure. Scrutinise, put into proof allegations and challenge them if appropriate. And a reply is a good place to sum up your case and drive home exactly why you are going to succeed. And of course, a judge will see that and understand it. So it's almost like you say the case is this in your POC. The defendants say the case is this in their defence. You've got the opportunity to say, aha, but this, pull it all together nicely in a reply and a judge will hopefully see that. And it's a good opportunity for you to sort of summarise the case. Uh, as a general point, obviously, it all depends on the case, the client, the defendant, the judge. Be flexible and reasonable, ready sometimes to concede disputes. Think of the repercussions, the cost benefits of a particular course of action, how it might impact upon the court process, how the defendant may react, what the client may think, and discuss the best way forward with colleagues and counsel. Dear judge letters, quite important sort of tool in your toolbox. Dear judge letters are letters addressed to the defendant, but in the knowledge the court may see them. Useful where there are disputes during the litigation, which may have to be resolved in court. Clear explanation of the issues, what you expect to happen and the repercussions. So it's basically, you know, dear defendant, we note that you say this, 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 we say this, this, this. We consider that the only way out of it is to do this, this, this. We reserve the right to draw this correspondence to the attention of the court um, if we don't resolve it in the way that we're suggesting. And, and then obviously when it gets to court, if an application has to be made, you say, look here, judge, here's this letter. And then the judge says, oh, well, you know, they did set it all up pretty clearly then, it's cost in the case or claimant's cost or whatever. Um, and it makes it clear that you will expose all this nonsense that I put there to the court, because sometimes things get very, especially with email, very sort of bickery, back and forth and back and forth. Just one, you know, sort of clear letter, this is the dispute, you know, this is what we're gonna do about it if it's not resolved. Um, and then obviously apply, if the wheel has come off, then you, you know, you obviously have to apply. It could be a change of an expert, it could be late service of evidence, a delay in joint meetings, a whole variety of, meet of issues why things have gone wrong. Um, you do a dear judge letter to the defendant first with a time limit seeking a consent order. So, you know, dear defendant, you know, unfortunately, this, is, this that and the other has happened. We appreciate this isn't entirely, um, you know, that th this is partly our fault or whatever, or however you want to phrase it. Um, but we think that this is the way out of it. We assume that you agree unless you have any other suggestions. And of course, they may be just saying you have to make an application seeking relief from sanctions and we want the costs of it. But anyway, if you do the dear judge letter first, saying that we're going to make this application, we're clearly going to succeed, we invite you to consent, we reserve the right to withdraw this letter to the attention of the court. You then send the draft application, giving them another sort of reminder, look, are you going to consent to this? Then you have to apply, then you have, obviously you have to apply. 
and you ask for costs and that they stand outside the budget. Just a tip here on lay expert evidence. Um, it comes from the case of ES. The claimant sought a direction yet they should be permitted to call two obstetric experts on the basis that two treating consultant obstetricians would be giving evidence for the defendant as well as the expert obstetrician. So essentially, the defendants are going to have their expert, uh, medical legal expert obstetrician, but they're also going to have two lay experts from the two treating consultant obstetricians. Um, I've had cases where the defendants have been, the defendant medical practitioners have been medico legal experts themselves. And that does raise the issue to what extent, you know, are we on a level playing field here? Uh, and on appeal, um, uh, Mr. Justice Holman, when a court is considering what practices may be adopted by a responsible body of medical opinion, it seems to me impossible to exclude evidence given by two doctors, now both consultant statuses, status of their own experience, however much they may be labelled and confined as witnesses of fact. So what I've done in two recent cases is sought that recital. Uh, and upon the claim of putting the defendant in the court on notice that she may make an application for further expert evidence in relying upon the authority. Now, if, if anything, that serves as a warning shot across the bowels to the defendant, make sure your witnesses of fact are purely witnesses of fact. Now, obviously, they have to explain why they took the particular course that they took, but they will have in their mind that they are witnesses of fact, and it needs, therefore, to be relatively limited. Uh, in terms of what their explanation is, and certainly not stray into the realms of an expert. And that seems to have worked. Obviously, if they do stray, then you have to make the application, but it'll, by definition, be after service of their witness statements. Um, timing of Part 36 offers, usefully made after a positive development or a tactical manoeuvre which puts pressure on the other side, not before a reasonable valuation can be made. Um, leaving offers on the table, I've mentioned that before, and if rejecting, provide reasons. Uh, be cautious of call to bank offers, uh, don't be put under pressure. Um, I always call these in con with client, you know, carpet room sales, um, carpet room shop offers. You know, if you really believe that uh, sale is on at the carpet showroom only for that weekend, well, you're going to be attracted by a call to bank. I don't know if defendants still do it, but anyway, you see these call to bank offers, they don't you know, they shouldn't put anybody under pressure. Um, and considered offers on liability in clinic cases reflecting litigation risk, which may assist in settlement. Interim payment. Um, this is something I sometimes feel a bit, you know, sort of strongly about because in many cases, you have the calling client after liability, the telehandler case was one uh, case in point. It took five years to get to trial. I speak to the client and he is in penury. He is suffering badly. Uh, and the defendants are being incredibly sort of tight fisted about interims, even though liability is now resolved. And, you know, I just find it amazing sometimes. Um, so, you know, if liability is admitted, get that interim payment. The difficulty is that there's no better way of prompting an offer if you ask for an interim payment and you may not be ready to value the claim. But there is that balance there and give PI trust advice at the earliest opportunity well in advance of a request for an interim payment and assist the claimant in setting it up because often they're not going to be ready to be able to do that for themselves. Just a point about contributory negligence, uh, obviously rarely successful if ever in ClinNeg. Uh, be cautious about giving too much away in workplace claims and cautious as to contrib in RTAs involving vulnerable road users, particularly children. And I put there the court's approach in such cases is inconsistent. If children get run over a lot, that reflects the nature of childhood and lack of road sense, not that they're inherently negligent. Uh, and, I, you know, this is an interesting one. Um, I was just looking at this recently. Um, Jackson and Murray, a Scottish case, is a good example. The first instance judge reduced damages by 90% for contributory negligence. Then the inner house, which I assume is a bit like the Court of Appeal, reduced contributory negligence to 70%. And then the Supreme Court reduced it to 90%. So that sort of demonstrates the inconsistency. Um, and then I managed to pull out when I was dealing with one of these cases, I can't believe that's too small. 
There's an article, it's in Psychological Science by one Porter and Purcell. And it says, we demonstrate that for a given pedestrian crossing time, vehicles traveling faster loom less than slower vehicles, which creates a dangerous illusion. Our results from perceptual tests of looming thresholds show strong development trend, trends in sensitivity, such that children may not be able to detect vehicles approaching at speeds in excess of 20 miles per hour. This creates a risk of injudicious road crossing in urban settings when traffic speeds are higher than 20, 20 miles an hour. Um, so, I mean, that's just a sort of general observation. You know, why are all of these children being found contributory negligent? So I said, contributory negligent, I asked rhetorically. You know, if children get run over a lot, that's because they're children and they don't have road sense. Their perceptual faculty is actually not very well developed. So, I mean, I, I read a very interesting article by a Scottish academic about this, which has sort of made me run with it. But what I'm trying to do now is actually get psychological evidence as to what I just read, hopefully from one of those experts um, who wrote that article, and also epidemiological evidence as to the incidence of how many children get run over compared to non-drunk adults, if I can call it that. Um, children just don't have road sense. So it's, you know, these 12, 13, 10-year-olds, 14-year-olds being found 50% contributory negligence, it sits very uneasily for me. But um, courts are bound by the evidence that are presented to them. And I think it's up to lawyers to get that evidence and present it to the court. Uh, quantum issues always spend most time and thought on the largest items of loss. That may seem obvious, but sometimes you see massively detailed schedules putting, you know, taxi expenses and, um, you know, prescription fees and ibuprofen for 28p in Tesco's and all the rest of it. Ensure care claims are supported by client and justifiable. Be cautious, of cut, be cautious of cutting and pasting care reports. I've certainly had claims where, you know, beefy chaps who've suffered a horrible arm injury, you know, it's being suggested that they have, you know, these carers cutting up their food for them. And you've asked them, are you going to get that care in? No. So, you know, sometimes these care reports are fiction and it is up to us to cut out the fiction, leaving the realistic. Um, ensure correct multipliers are used, e.g. state pension age rather than 65 care claims for the elderly. That's, again, something I feel quite strongly about, you know, I think because a lot of lawyers are, you know, young and hale and hearty. We forget that 65, 70, 75 year old, 80, 85 year olds are perfectly capable of mowing a lawn, uh, doing vacuuming, cleaning the windows. But how often do I see schedules? where I see at 75, the claimant wouldn't have been able to do these things themselves. Of course they would, and most elderly people do. Um, consider farming out loss of earnings pension loss to forensic accountants, white label report. I know other council would disagree and they say council can do them. Of course, council can do them. But I had a look at one the other day where 16, pounds, 16 hours was charged at £165 an hour. It's going to be a lot cheaper, really good report from a forensic accountant dealing with uh, loss of earnings and pension loss, condescending to particulars, fantastic. It's just more efficient. Uh, cruise certificates, uh, these are often fiction, post universal credit. It's a benefit for the family, includes previously non-deductible benefits such as housing benefit, child benefit. I had a con on this yesterday, and I think sisters online in fact, where nearly 50,000 pounds was being deducted for crew, a lot of which were for benefits that the claimant was receiving anyway. And bearing in mind the defendants were disputing that she really needed uh, any time off work or it wasn't attributable to the accident. It's madness to take £50,000 off their offer. Uh, and it's you know, incredibly difficult to deal with these cruise certificates now. They've introduced universal credit, but they haven't sort of updated the DWP properly. But you have to keep an eye on that. Uh, mediation joint settlement meetings. NHS resolutions seem to prefer mediation, and I think the reason is mediators tend to prioritise compromise as opposed to a risk-based approach. So they, I mean, a mediator told me this, essentially, when they brought in, they went for the low-hanging fruit. They're all about getting the compromise there, you know, offering things that generally the clients aren't interested in. You know, do you want an apology? Well, yeah, only if it's written on the back of a cheque. Um, and obviously, council aren't going to advise people to take a lesser offer just because they've been given an apology as well. Um, it can result in later settlements. I say that there are some very good mediators, so they do differ. 
But, you know, I mean, I've had um, a mediation in, a, in cases and I've said to my opposite number at the end, do you think we could have got to exactly the same figure in half the time without a, me half the time without a mediator? And she said, yes, I do. And, you know, I'm not sure really what they bring to the party. Um, JSM, RTM, certainly, obviously, that's done on the basis of reflecting the risk of going to court, risk of succeeding, risk of in relation to valuation. You know, you've got 70% risk of succeeding and 60% risk of not getting this, that and the other. You can work it all out. Um, must be a fighting chance of value in the claim for the successful JSMs and obviously client expectations. The way I always do it, counsel should prepare a position statement and parameters of settlement, both of which should be discussed with the claimant so everybody is on board. Um, that actually is the end of the talk. Um, just before we go to questions, um, just to alert, there's a new pathway. For, this is obviously for clinical negligent practitioners who are undertaking corduroy quina cases. There's a really important document just come out, which is a new national pathway for suspected corduroy quina syndrome. I've written an article about it, which is it was came out yesterday. I've written an article about it, which um, should be distributed imminently. Um, so it says there, um, looking at analysing the recommendations from a legal perspective, there is also an NHS England webinar, which is essentially introducing this new national pathway, which is going to be led by Mike Hutton, who was the lead author, um, consultant spinal surgeon. That's a public seminar. On the 2nd of March 2023, there is a link there. I think Sarah was going to provide a link in the chat function if she was able to do it somehow. I'm not quite sure whether she has, but in any event, it's on the 2nd of March. If you're interested in call to require cases, I strongly advise that um, you get hold of, well, my article, obviously, uh, the actual pathway, which there's a link to there, and then attend the seminar on the 2nd of March. Uh, and I'm giving a five minute legal perspective at that seminar. In fact, I've been invited to do that. So um, that's a little ad there. One other ad, um, which is that uh, Chambers has got on the 1st of November, 2023, our uh, clinical negligence conference. It's going to be held at St. George's Hall in Bristol, which is a beautiful venue, actually. They used to do a lot of classical concerts there, probably still do. So it's the 1st of November, 2023. Um, we've got three expert speakers uh, who, who will be speaking. We've got two of them, Jane Horden, who is an expert neonatologist and Professor Dimitrios Siasakos, who is confirmed as the expert obstetrician. We're waiting on the name of one expert, but um, you know, mark it in your diary or look out for it because we had one last year. It was very well received, very well attended. Um, we had three speakers at that event as well. That was on delay and diagnosis of cancer. This one is on obstetrics. Um, and it's, uh, we all know how expensive.